Hello and welcome to Data Expresso, a podcast for data professionals who want to build their career around data, analytics and technology. I'm Eva Murray, a data-loving bread-baking runner based in London. And I'm Helena Schwenk, a swimmer, dog lover and coastal walker. Together, we lead tech evangelism at Exasol and we're here to talk all things data. This podcast brings you fresh insights, talking points, and stories from the world of analytics. So grab your favorite drink, sit back, and join us for new stories from the world of data. Welcome from my colleague Helena and I to this episode of Data Expresso, the second episode of 2021. And we're both really delighted that you're with us once again and that we can kick off properly this new year. It's good to have you and let's get started with today's episode. We're going to talk about data democratization and the question of, you know, is there something behind this word? Is it just another buzzword or do we really see something valuable behind it? And I think we both agree that we do think it's important for organizations to consider how they can democratize data in, uh, in their business, to bring it to more people, get more people involved. But also, you know, what are maybe some of the challenges and what do we see happening in the industry at the moment? And with that, Helena, uh, thanks for joining me again. It's great to be back here with you and uh, kick off another episode. Yes, it is indeed. Um, yeah, so second one of uh, 2021. Um, I think this is a great topic to start with. Um, I think it is, as you've mentioned, it's a term, it's um, uh, a phrase that people have come to understand, but perhaps we actually need to dig behind a bit more of the basics just to re reacquaint ourselves um, with this term. So in particular, why does data democratization matter? Um, and I'd be curious to get your thoughts on that, Eva, and especially given that you're very active in, in data communities, have you seen the benefits of data democratization or making data more accessible to people across the organization? Yeah, it's a good, good question. And I think for me, data democratization, first and foremost, is really about having a diversity of thought. The idea being, let's bring data to more people so we get more people's ideas and thoughts and opinions, but also their perspective on um, you know, the facts and the data. And also bringing together people from business context and from you know, more technical backgrounds, because typically we see data analysts, data scientists working with data and they have their perspectives, they have maybe their own assumptions and they focus on the facts and they do the analysis and pass that on. But what if we bring in people from other backgrounds? What value can they add to that process? And that's where I think, you know, bringing in those business experts who maybe don't know much about statistics or, you know, analytics, data models, but they have maybe even decades of experience in the business, in the industry, and they can ask very different questions. And bringing these people together, I think is a really strong way to democratize data and to really involve everyone in coming up with questions. I was going to say, when looking at data democratization, um, and I agree a lot with what you're saying there, I see this perhaps in two parts. I think traditionally, uh, conventionally, um, IT has been the sort of gatekeepers of, of data. So part of data democratization is perhaps removing some of those bottlenecks that may exist for other, others in the organization to get access to data. So I think that's one part. And the other part that I think is really relevant and what you talk about really well here is about enabling more users to use that data for their own um, uh, decision making, their own job roles. And a lot of data democratization focuses on enabling perhaps less technically aware users um, and ensuring that they can get access 
to data in the right format, in the right way, that makes it easier for them to do their job. Yeah, absolutely. And I like the point that you make about the IT departments, because I've seen the same. Traditionally, IT departments and IT staff were the ones who were uh, having access to data, who created reports and dashboards. And I wonder, why should that be the case? Why should that be limited just to for them to access? And I'm not saying they shouldn't or they don't have the, the, the skills. They certainly probably have the skills. Um, and I'm sure that a lot of them also have enough of that business context. But the nature of these, these teams is often that, well, they only have limited time to actually devote to this topic because they also have to look at IT security and maybe hardware and onboarding and all of these things. So analytics probably is just one of their topics rather than a standalone uh, area that is really focused on. And also, it then becomes a bit more functional. It's just about creating some reports according to specifications, specifications that were maybe created two months ago and that have changed in the meantime. But because of this process of sending a request and, um, you know, just the timing of things, it's it's just not going to really suit the processes and the needs of very agile, modern digital businesses. So on the one hand, there's a question of how much do these IT departments really know about the business, the questions they have, maybe the problems they're facing, but also is the, um, you know, the skills that exist in those teams, I believe, from my experience, are very technical. So yes, they can solve um, problems, they can address the questions or the requirements that were provided, but is that equivalent to truly analytical expertise, uh, which I think is a different skill set. And that's not to you know, criticize anyone. It's just, we have different people with different skills. Let's bring them together. So let's remove the bottleneck, as you mentioned, let's remove this um, yeah, limitation of bringing data just to IT folks and bring the data across the business to see what else uh, we could achieve with that. Yeah, certainly. And I, I suppose many of our listeners will say, well, I'm very familiar with data democratization. It has been a term that has been used, a buzzword that's been used for uh, quite some time. So why are we talking about this now? And um, and I would argue that organizations um, are seeing plenty more upside to data democratization. And I would argue that it's becoming increasingly important now more than ever since we you know, face a challenging environment, economic pressures, changing business priorities that require us to adapt at ever uh, greater pace. We're also seeing lots of changes in our working patterns as well, working from home, for example. So it's got to be easier for everyone to be able to access that data, whoever we are in whatever job, increasingly we need data to support it in some shape or form, some more than others, but we need that access to data to be easier. It needs to be at our fingertips, ideally, wherever we are, to get our jobs done, to be able to adapt to different, you know, market conditions, business conditions, and ideally to grow the business as well. Absolutely. And I think there's also this, there's a couple of other points I want to add to that. One is that I think data democratization is really supported by technology because there are tools that really enable it. And there are, there are also tools, typically the more traditional uh, legacy tools that maybe are maybe not a hindrance, but they don't they certainly don't support a democratization as such because they're just from a different era. Um, but I also want to think back to when we had a conversation about decision making and you told us about the research that we've done um, that a lot of people have noticed that through this pandemic and this huge uh, <laughs> speeding up of digital transformation, that many organizations have recognized that if they involve more people early on in the process, they can make better decisions. But to make decisions, we all need facts and we need you know, to understand what the data says. And that's another argument for data democratization. If we're suddenly seeing more people needing data to make decisions to, like you say, do their jobs, then we need to understand how can we get the data to them in the first place? 
but also enable them with the right skills and the right tools to make those decisions accurately and not maybe have wrong conclusions or wrong assumptions. So Helena, what I'm curious is, what does the market actually say about data democratization? Have you seen an increase maybe in the discussions about the topic? And do you think there's some momentum already among companies that they head into that direction? Yeah, so the second part of your question, and I'll, I'll tackle first because <laughs> it kind of follows on from what I've just said there. Um, in terms in the increase in discussion, it's, it's been dis uh, it, it is a discussion that has been had for quite some years now, you know, the discussion around data democratization. But yes, there is definitely a greater uh, imperative now to ensure that more people have access to data in order to do their job. And that's driven by all of the things that I've just previously mentioned, but also the fact that we are accelerating or many organizations and industries that we um, uh, work with are accelerating their digital transformation. So that's one thing I would say. So it's definitely growing in terms of a topic that is uh, moving up the agenda, perhaps is a, a different way of, uh, of saying it. Um, in terms of what the market is saying about data democratization, I would say it's actually quite hard to get really clear cut evidence of the degree um, that organizations or industries have when it comes to data democratization. Um, uh, and that's possibly because it's actually quite hard to uniformly track and monitor data democratization, mainly because it means different things to different people. Sharing a report may be um, data democratization for some, whereas actually having um, a, a data culture that it incentivizes the sharing of organization across departments may be another view to it. So it is hard to get sort of some clear facts on this. However, I have looked into this <laughs> and uh, all my sort of market research data sources, and we can use um, a bit of a proxy really to look at how data is used to inform or make decisions um, as this is ultimately the main aim of data democratization. So critically, we can, we've got a view of how many organizations use data to inform those decisions. So Forrester is one uh, source I've looked at, and they looked at data and analytics decision makers, and they found that 45% of their business decisions were based on quantitative data. So data that is emanating from BI and analytic systems, for example. But this also means that half, over half of business decisions aren't based on quantitative data. They're probably based more on qualitative factors like intuition and gut feel. So while I see there is plenty of goodwill and emphasis and talk about data democratization, this data would suggest there is a fair way to go. And I thought it was also interesting to just to dig a bit deeper around those stats, because we can also look at what type of data is actually used. And Forrester also found that about 50% um, of uh, data that is used within the organization is structured data. Uh, whereas 25% of it is unstructured and 38% of it is semi-structured. Um, and that is, uh, these are sort of metrics that haven't changed significantly that much over the last few years. So to me, that indicates that you, know, you could argue that data democratization is or the levels of data democratization are different across different types of data and i suppose it's 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 um not surprising in certain respects because bi and analytical systems uh, their data tends to come from structured transactional systems um, and that's why there's a higher use case there whereas unstructured and semi-structured data the tools and the technologies and the and the 
processes for capturing and using and harnessing that data are perhaps less pervasive, uh, pervasive and perhaps less mature. It's really interesting to see those numbers. And you said, you know, over 50% of businesses don't actually use quantitative data to make decisions. I find like that very interesting, but I guess it also depends on who responded, because if it's a really broad variety of businesses, then I wouldn't be surprised. Um, so it'll be, yeah, I'd be curious to see how that develops over the coming uh, months and then of course years, but as we continue living through this pandemic, um, I'm sure that is going to increase because just it's the necessity of things. So yeah. Yeah, and a survey is always a snapshot. Um, and again, it will depend on lots of different factors as to how they've actually answered those questions. But I think broadly speaking, that um, there is still some way to go in maturity and adoption of data and analytics to ensure that there is more pervasive use of data across all all. Um, elements of the organization across all job roles. We know that there's concentrated efforts where data is used on a very regular basis, but data democratization is about ensuring more people have access um, and have data available to them. And perhaps uh, that's where the, 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 those data democratization efforts need to focus. Um, I would I would actually, there was one thing that I wanted to also mention here, because I, I do believe technology, as you've uh, talked about, is a great enabler. It is the enabler of data democratization and opening up data to more and more people. But the more research I read around this would suggest that um, data culture also plays a huge part in this. Um, and, you know, you can't really have data democratization without having a, a very successful and a strong data culture at the same time. And that's because it requires organizations to rethink how they manage, um, how they distribute and how they consume data. Um, and that really needs uh, uh, some sort of changes in terms of how people view data, the mindset and, and how it's incentivized or encouraged within organizations at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk next about some of the practical elements of data democratization. How easy is it for organizations to get started? We know it's easy to talk about the term and the concept, but can they actually put this into practice? What, what's your thoughts there, Eva? Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question because it's one that I really love to talk about. Uh, I've talked to a lot of people and organizations about, you know, what could you actually do to maybe start communities and start some of these initiatives that will drive not only data democratization, but also data literacy internally. And it's always easy to talk about, well, you could do this, you could do that, but putting it into practice is not that simple because not just are we all dealing with, you know, people and, um, but also, you know, there are other commitments to your day job but also there's technology, there's other bottlenecks, there's timings and budgets. So what I would recommend is let's just start at what's the status quo, what data is currently available, what is restricted when we're just thinking about data democratization, because really it's about currently somebody can only access, for example, finance data, but in the future, they would also like to access marketing and production data and potentially the other business departments data as well. So what can you currently see and access and work with? What can't you? And then asking the question, what are the limitations and why are they in place? Is there a really good reason because there are legislative or there's regulations of why you as a person or in your role can't access this data? And then if there aren't good reasons, well, can you challenge those reasons? Can you make a change? Can you drive a change in organization that leads to more data democratization because quite often it might just be politics quite often people say well this is our area of expertise this is what we do and you don't kind of meddle with it so 
challenging that, I'm I'm a huge fan of you know disrupting things a bit and asking, not just accepting what it is, but actually challenging it and saying, well, why is this the case? Let's do something different. And then identifying the right people, uh, because for data democratization to work, you will need to involve more people than are currently involved, because if more people should access the data, there needs to be a bit of guidance. So you might need some champions who can ask questions, answer questions and provide some support for those who are suddenly getting access to data, but don't quite necessarily know maybe what some of the definitions are, where to find certain KPIs or how to analyze, how to interpret certain results. So finding these people depends on their skill levels, uh, but also the experience and expertise they bring. And it's not just about the champions, it's also about, well, who else should have access? Let's say you're an organization that is really keen to push ahead with making data as democratized as possible, giving lots and lots of people access. But still, you will probably go in different phases so that the people who have access to it either are trained or are going to receive training and they have use for the data. There will probably always be some jobs where people just don't need data to do their day to day work because it just doesn't isn't demanded uh, for them or maybe they get told by others what the results are that they're aiming for um, and they don't need to do analysis themselves what's also important is what's the level of data literacy across the organization and i've mentioned the question of training just a little while ago so when you identify the people that you want to involve um, as champions but also as i guess recipients of more data What's their data literacy levels? How much do they know? And are there areas that are need, needing uh, some improvements? You know, maybe there's some very simple uh, training that can be made available, but also there might be some bigger areas to address or bigger challenges to resolve. Now, what's really important, and this is something I'm very passionate about, is people need to have the right skills to work with data. Because especially these days, we get more and more tools on the market that make it so easy to work with data. You just drag and drop and you get some visualizations. You might even see some really interesting data points come to some assumptions and maybe some conclusions. The question is, is it valid? Is it reliable? Can you actually make those conclusions? Because it's not just a matter of being able to use the software, but understanding how it works and why it does certain things. Why does the tool that you use do certain aggregations? Or why does it display the data in a certain format? And is that format valid? Or could it be misleading? So it's not just about using software. It's also about really understanding the basics of statistics and how to you know, form some hypotheses and challenge those and test them to come to an outcome that you can really stand behind and that you can say, yes, I, I am confident that this is the case. Because when people across the organization use data to develop like outputs such as reports or dashboards that are used to make decisions, they need to be basically watertight. Uh, so that is something really important, really understanding what is the current level of skills and what does it need to be before people can reliably and independently work with the data they, they start having access to. And then as a kind of concrete step of making things happen, I would suggest just use one specific project or department and start with that. Creating a process that works. So for example, you start with finance data or you start with marketing data and just focus on getting that one step right, proving the value and then rolling it out further. But it's gonna be a, an iterative process with hopefully a few you know, quick iterations that show you, yep, this works, this maybe doesn't, let's fix it, let's change it and then moving on to other departments, because that way you can also achieve more buy-in across the organization and really get people over on your side so that this becomes a success. Yeah, um, I really like that point. And it's a point um, not to be underestimated because seeing is believing. Mm. <laughs> um, so proving the value is, is really critical here because I think when people start to understand that this data democratization thing gives them the data they need, the answers they need to be more effective in their roles, then they won't want to go back really. And they're much more likely to adopt the best practices 
that you talk about, um, you know, the analysis techniques, perhaps even they could skill themselves to train others or incentivize others to use data in the same way. So it kind of creates um, a bit more of a, a virtuous cycle, really, if you can show the value to people, they can really see it and believe it. Yeah, and I think when you start using data and asking the data before you maybe work, you know, refine your idea, sure, it will probably kill some ideas because they just don't seem viable, but it will very likely give rise to new ideas that people never came across because they can see in the data that there's an interesting area or there's an outlier, and maybe that outlier is the next new product. So um, I think while, yes, the data makes it all a very rational, unemotional process, it will remove some of the fluff and it will introduce some new opportunities as well. Now, what I'm wondering is how could we quantify the benefits? So if we look at data democratization and we, we argue it's not just a buzzword, there is actually some substance behind it. It's gonna be quite hard to put it into numbers, but are there any numbers that show that yes, data democratization works? For example, it can maybe increase productivity or, or maybe people as they, you know, you start using data like we just described, they may be more engaged because it's easier to do their job. And maybe, you know, if it comes to a new product, we could even increase revenue from it. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I've definitely seen and also read plenty about the benefits to data democratization. Um, and it's broadly in the forms of, as you've mentioned, you know, increasing revenue, for instance, but also around providing perhaps a better customer experience about improving operational efficiency, as well as other sort of benefits knock on benefits perhaps around good governance of that data. That's where a lot of organizations uh, uh, see benefit. But I think in order to bring this to life, it's worth drawing on a couple of examples. Um, and we've touched or at least spoken about one of our customers before, but I think it's worth reiterating here. Um, so Revolut is a challenger bank and it's one of the biggest players in uh, a fairly crowded fintech market. Um, and they're doing some really interesting things around data democratization. They have approximately 30, 13 million global users. And in order to service those users and customers, they've built uh, a data uh, repository that can be accessed um, and the data within it is available across multiple departments to support their need for data querying and reporting. Um, and that's everyone from sort of HR to sales to operations to finance. Now, a large part of this data democratization is to get greater insight from that data at the same time. So there has been a project to build more granular personalization for their customers to ensure that they've got the insights they need to determine the right offer to that customer, the right response perhaps to that customer and the right action. So with all the data in the right place. Uh, the business has been very heavily involved. So I'm, I'm keen to emphasize that these are business users. So it isn't, this isn't uh, an activity that's necessarily wholly been channeled through IT, but the business can define sort of micro segmentations in that customer base. So they have the ability to explore things such as payments data, uh, debit card statements, customer demographics, mobile transfers, and all of that good stuff, according to uh, the right access privileges. What I think is also interesting, sort of the knock-on effects of this, this greater use of data, is that they've been very effective in building what are called next product to purchase models 
based on that data so that they can provide recommendations to frontline staff about a, a product that they may offer a customer. And as a result, as a direct result, they're seeing an increase in sales, but also customer retention based on the insight from that data. So I thought that was a really interesting example. And then I've been looking elsewhere outside the exosol sphere. Um, and I see there's plenty of examples across industries. The one that I thought was particularly relevant at the moment was pharma. So there are um, uh, plenty of efforts in this industry to democratize data by creating a shared framework across clinical trial phases so that they can give all the researchers involved real-time data and, and ensure that they can work with that data, but also exchange and share that data where uh, necessary across all parts of the process. Um, and as a result, there's definitely been a shift uh, to achieve better, faster data flow in the uh, clinical trials process. Um, and this has accelerated the drug uh, pipeline um, in lots of different cases. Um, and I thought this was interesting, <laughs> primarily because of the situation that we have with the pandemic and vaccines uh, as well. So, you know, one surefire way is of perhaps accelerating that process is about increasing data democratization and giving greater accessibility to all the parties that need to be involved to this clinical uh, trial data to ensure that they can develop the most effective vaccines. So um, they're just sort of two examples where I'm seeing um, uh, benefits um, around data democratization. Yeah, and the pharma example is really interesting because I'm pretty confident that the scientific community has for many, many years been very collaborative across the globe. And when we look at the current political situation, you know, there's there's collaboration, yes, but there are also some countries that don't quite play nicely and they don't want to share. And it's it's almost like science is just saying, well, to hell with it. You know, we're going to collaborate no matter what the politicians are doing. And they, it's finally visible. I think it's visible for the whole world just how much can be achieved by this relatively small amount of researchers, given you know the world population, who are collaborating to really like save lives on a massive, massive scale in a, such a short amount of time, given how robust these trials need to be and how reliable the results need to be so that we can all confidently go get the jab, protect ourselves and others. So I find that super fascinating. And like you say, I mean, it's a, it's a great example of democratizing data. And while it's not within an organization, it's within the scientific community. And it's so, so important because if they didn't do that and if every team just, you know, as we say in German, cook their own soup, it would be so much harder. We would have to wait so much longer. So I think that's a really, really relevant and uh, very um, relatable example to have. Mm. Now, Eleanor, we always try to give some very technical next steps for our listeners. And, you know, we've already shared some ideas on how they can get started. But did you, uh, in your research, did you come across any resources um, that we can maybe share? I mean, we can provide links, but also is there something you recommend they go to? Yeah, so I can definitely uh, say that I read lots of research and from that I can certainly highlight those that I see as providing a good source of information, plenty of practical examples um, and, you know, also trust the provenance of that information. So my, my go-tos really, um, and these are, there's plenty of paid resources, so I'm not gonna mention those, <laughs> but in terms of free resources, then I often find that McKinsey, um, I really uh, 
um, rate their research and they do a whole body of research around data and analytics from the very sort of strategic side to it very much through to the sort of practical and tactical side of using data and analytics across the organization across um, industries um, and they have uh, some interesting uh, articles and research linked to data democratization as well um, and the second one I would mention is Harvard Business Review now I know it is a paid for but they do allow a number of free articles per month so you just have to be uh, very tactical in in what articles you choose to read but again a very excellent source of, of research there across industries. Um, and they really do, in my opinion, understand about data and data democratization as well. And the other sources, which I'm, I'm sure we're all familiar with, seeing as uh, lots of us are perhaps working at home and on lockdowns and have perhaps a bit of time they want to kill, is around you know, other podcasts and TED Talks in particular, providing a valuable source from experts in their field and how they make it or how they see data working for them. So definitely um, happy to put some links to these in, in the resources that we share as part of this podcast. Excellent, thank you. And that actually brings us to the end of this episode. And now I want to provide a bit of a wrap up because there's a lot of different things we talked about uh, right in the beginning from, you know, why does it actually matter to democratize data and what are some of the benefits? And um, I think we provided somewhat of a definition of data democratization um, and then looked at, well, are people actually doing it? Is there an appetite for data democratization in the market? And I think we can all agree that a lot of organizations are heading that way, but I think there's still a long way to go and we all have a bit of room for improvement. And we shared some ideas on how people can get started, um, you know, involving people, coming up with a pilot project, but also assessing the status quo to set some realistic expectations. And we've learned how it's challenging to really quantify the benefit, but we have you know, seen examples of where data democratization helps a business, but also customers, end user stakeholders, and also us as people benefiting from the science community collaborating. And then lastly, the resources that you've mentioned, and I have to say, I'm also a huge fan of the McKinsey research pages and the articles they provide. They are easy to read, they're not dumbed down by any means, but they're easy to read, they're very accessible uh, in, on a lot of topics, especially around analytics. And I'll hand over to you, Helena, for some final words. So I suppose in terms of final thoughts, um, thinking about some of the sort of tactical steps that uh, organisations can take to improve their efforts around this. Um, I think there's three that seem to sort of rise to the top when looking at market surveys, you know, what's inhibiting people, and that's around the integration of data. So it, as a step, really, do you have a good understanding of your data ecosystem and how you may be able to bring more data together for use within your organization? The second area is very much around user training. So we've touched on this as well, but you know, just to re-emphasize that raising data literacy levels or perhaps kickstarting your data literacy program would be a really good use of your time here. And lastly, we, we, we touched on this a little bit, but data governance is, is really, really important here, you know, because it provides trust. And without trust in your data, your data democratization effort is, is likely to be thwarted or at least slowed down. So it's about providing the right level of governance, the right security and protection, but also the right enabling tools and technology and high quality data that enable uh, data to get into the hands of the right people fast. So with that, I will wrap up. Uh, this episode of Data Expresso. Thank you very much for downloading and listening to it. If you enjoyed it, we'd really appreciate if you could rate, review and subscribe. And even better, 
tell others as it will help us grow our network. In addition, further information and resources can be found in the show notes, which you can access um, through this podcast. And finally, as always, feel free to connect with us on social media in the usual way. We love to hear from you. So with that, I'd like to say goodbye and stay safe.